So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll just give it a few minutes for everyone to filter in before we introduce the speakers and get started. So the physiology of obesity mechanisms in medicine series started a few years ago when myself and co-organizer Dr. Joe Lewis at the University of Cambridge felt there was scope to develop an ECR focused symposia which could give more speaking opportunities to fellow ECRs and bring those of us in the obesity and metabolic disease field together to network and disseminate results. After three successful symposia at the European Congress on Obesity, Experimental Biology and a day at Physiology 19, we're delighted to now bring this into a webinar series to give fellow ECRs the opportunity to present and network during a time when conferences are being cancelled and opportunities to do so are minimal. With over a thousand registrations across 40 countries, it's great to see so many of you here as we begin the Hepatic Regulation of Appetite and Disease session. So today we have co-chair Mary Moore, a PhD candidate from Professor Scott Rector's lab at the University of Missouri, where her research is focused on the role of diet and exercise to combat NAPD. So before Mary introduces the speakers, there's a few housekeeping rules to go over. Our speakers will each give a 20 minute talk and we'll then have 15 to 20 minutes for open Q&A. Please submit any questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll direct these to the speakers during this section of the webinar. But you can submit these at any time during the talks. You have the option to do this anonymously if you'd like to. If not, please include your institution at the beginning and we can announce this with your name. Uh, we'll try and get through all questions and do this as soon as possible. You can upvote questions and type your answers or comments under, underneath other attendees' questions if you like. And finally, just to note, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch on the Society YouTube channel. And if you like, you can follow along with the physiology M2M hashtag on Twitter. Uh, over to you, Mary. Thanks, Pete. Um, so I'm going to introduce Sharon first. Uh, Sharon is currently a fifth year graduate student in Dr. Matthew Podoff's lab and a student in the Molecular Medicine Programme in the Department of Neuroscience and Pharmacology at the University of Iowa. Today, Sharon's talk is entitled um, FGF21 Signals to, to Glutaminergic Neurons in the Ventral Medial Hypothalamus to Suppress Carbohydrate Intake. And I'm going to let Sharon take it away. Thank you, Mary. I have since changed my title, so sorry about that. Um, I will share my screen now. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen. Mary, can you confirm just to be sure? Uh, yeah, I can see it. Okay, Looks good. Um, so again, my name is Sharon Jensen Cody. My new title is Novel Endocrine Circuit Regulating Macronutrient Preference. So I'm gonna use my laser pointer. Um, so the Podoff lab is really interested in understanding the neurobiology of energy homeostasis. And so we all know that the um, obesity epidemic continues to increase worldwide. And so we think it's really important to understand the physiological mechanisms that govern why we eat what we eat so that hopefully um, we can use a um, therapeutic strategy to one day combat this epidemic. So. Um, once food is eaten, that can be broken down into three primary macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And various hormones are able to sense um, food intake. And some of these hormones can enter circulation and um, act on homeostatic neurons, mainly um, within the hypothalamus to either promote further food intake or to induce satiety. So these neurons work in tandem to regulate energy homeostasis. So one of the hormones that the Podoff lab is primarily interested in is studying fibroblast growth factor 21 or FGF21. FGF21 is a member of the FGF19 family of endocrine hormones. It's produced mainly by the liver, but it's also produced um, by adipose tissue in the pancreas. And we know that FGF21 is able to signal to a receptor complex that consists of its main receptor, FGFR1C, as well as its co-receptor beta clotho or KLB. So we know that FGF21 binds directly to KLB, which then facilitates FGF21 binding to FGFR1C to elicit um, um, activation of downstream signaling. And we know that KLB is absolutely required for FGF21 signaling. 
So FGF21 has three main metabolic actions. The first being that acute pharmacological administration of FGF21 has been shown to increase insulin sensitivity. Um, next, chronic administration of FGF21 has been shown to increase energy expenditure, decrease fatty liver, and decrease body weight. And finally, we know that both acute and chronic administration of FGF21 has been shown to decrease sugar intake, sweet taste preference, and alcohol intake. And my project is really focused on how FGF21 decreases sugar intake and sweet taste preference. So we learned that FGF21 um, decreases sugar intake through this study that used a FGF21 whole body knockout mice that was, um, um, mice that was published in our lab a couple years ago. So what we did is we took um, these FGF21 knockout mice along with their wild type counterparts and we gave them the choice between water and a um, sugar solution. So here we're using 10% sucrose and we measured their sucrose intake every 24 hours over three days. And what we found was that lack of FGF21 dose dependently increases sucrose intake. Now, what's important to note is that this effect was specific to simple sugars. So when we repeated these experiments in these mice, um, giving them the choice between water and intralipid or water and casein or protein, um, lack of FGF21 had no effect on um, lipid or protein intake. So it was specific to simple sugars. We then wanted to determine whether pharmacological administration of FGF21 would be sufficient to lower sugar intake. And so what we did is we took wild type C57 black six mice, again, gave them the choice between water and sucrose and measured their sucrose intake every 24 hours over eight days in response to either uh, IP injection of vehicle or FGF21. And what we found is that pharmacological administration of FGF21 was sufficient to um, significantly decrease sucrose intake. And this lasted even after we stopped treating with FGF21, indicating that FGF21 is playing a role in mediating um, the suppression of carbohydrate specific intake. So what we have is a model in which upon sucrose ingestion, sucrose can be broken down into fructose and glucose. And these high glucose levels are sensed by the liver, which is able to send post-ingestive signals to promote further sucrose intake. In the meantime, the liver um, um, generates FGF21, which is able to enter circulation to block further sucrose intake. Now, through data that I'm not showing here for the sake of time, we know that FGF21 acts specifically in the brain at, in a specific nucleus called the hypothalamus to lower sugar intake. And so when I joined the lab, I was really interested in understanding how exactly FGF21 is acting in the brain to lower sugar intake and sweet taste preference. So which neuron is it acting in? Which specific region is it acting on? And what's it doing to those neurons? So to understand how FGF21 is acting in the brain, we first needed to determine where it was acting in the brain, um, specifically in the hypothalamus to lower sugar intake. And so to do that, we generated KLB Cree reporter mice. So like I said, KLB is FGF21's co-receptor. And we generated these reporter mice by knocking into the endogenous KLB locus, a Cree IRES TD tomato sequence to effectively allow um, expression of TD tomato um, uh, dependent on endogenous KLB expression. When I took brains from these mice and sectioned through them, um, we didn't see any TD tomato in the brain whatsoever. Um, and this was um, likely because of um, KLB's low expression in the brain. And so what we did is we then back crossed these mice to a TD tomato reporter mouse. And again, I took brain sections from these mice. And what we found was when looking in the hypothalamus, is robust ex, um, expression of TD tomato fluorescence specifically in, excuse me, specifically in the arcuate nucleus, the ventromedial hypothalamus, the paraventricular nucleus, and the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus, all regions that have been shown to regulate energy homeostasis. Now, with this mouse model that we have here, not only are we labeling cells that may currently um, be expressing KLB, but we're also labeling cells that may have ever expressed KLB and is not currently expressing it. And so to determine um, the regions of the hypothalamus or the regions of the brain that KLB is currently being expressed in the adult mouse, 
we took our KLB cream mice and we infected them with the PHP B flex T tomato virus. And this virus allows for um, TD tomato expression throughout the entire CNS in a Cree dependent manner. So we're um, label labeling um, uh, KLB in the adult mouse. Again, after taking brain sections from these mice and sectioning through, um, we did find robust TD tomato expression in the hypothalamus. Here we see it in the ventromedial hypothalamus. So um, this mouse model was great because it allowed us to actually visualize where <clears throat> KLB was expressed in the brain. Um, but we next wanted to determine the identity of these um, KLB positive cells within the hypothalamus. So what we did is we dissected out whole hypothalami from our KLB Cree TD tomato mice. And we fact sorted from, um, for TD tomato positive cells and ran that through our BD Rhapsody single cell RNA sequencing system. With that, we generated this T-SNE analysis where we identified 12 neuronal and non-neuronal cell types um, expressing or positive for KLB. Of the neuronal cell types, the three that really stood out to us were glutamatergic, GABAergic, and dopaminergic neurons. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the brain, glutamatergic neurons are um, known to be the excitatory neurons in the brain, while GABAergic neurons are the inhibitory neurons. And of course, dopaminergic neurons are the brain's rewarding neurons. So we wanted to know whether FGF21 was acting on glutamatergic, GABAergic, or dopaminergic neurons to elicit its effects on lowering sugar intake. And so before I um, take you through that data, I first want to walk you through how we generate our mouse models, because throughout my PhD, I've used a lot of mice, so I just want to give them a quick shout out. Um, so typically what we do is we cross our KLB flocks mice with a Cree driver line. So here we're crossing these mice specifically to VGLUT2 Cree, VGAT Cree, or DAT Cree mice to generate mice that lack KLB expression effectively in glutamatergic, GABAergic, or dopaminergic neurons. We then take these KLB knockout mice along with their wild type counterparts and give them the choice between water and a um, sugar solution. And then we measure their sugar intake. So first here, we're looking at um, data from wall type mice and KLBV GLUT2 knockout mice. Um, and um, this data shown here is the average daily sucrose intake. And what we found was that while wall type mice decreased their sucrose intake in response to FGF21, this effect was lost in our KLBV GLUT2 knockout mice. Interesting to note, we did see an um, increase in basal sucrose intake in our KLB VGLUT2 knockout mice. So these data indicate that um, KLB expression on glutamatergic neurons is required for um, the pharmacological effects of FGF21, but it's also required for the endogenous effects of FGF21 to lower sucrose intake. When we repeated these experiments, um, giving mice a choice between water and saccharin, Again, while wild type mice decreased their saccharin intake, this effect was lost in our KLBV GLUT2 knockout mice. We then repeated these experiments using KLBV GAT and KLB DAT knockout mice. And um, not surprisingly, these um, KLBV GAT and KLB DAT knockout mice had a decrease in both sucrose intake and saccharin intake in response to FGF21 indicating that FGF21 is signaling specifically to glutamatergic neurons to lower sucrose intake. We then wanted to know if we activate these KLB um, VGLUT2 neurons, is that sufficient to suppress sucrose intake? And so to activate these neurons, we took a chemogenetic approach using designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs or DREDs. And, um, Typically, what we have is a neurotransmitter that's able to act on a G-protein coupled receptor to either increase or decrease neuronal activity. With our DRED, um, we've modified this G-protein coupled receptor such that only a designer drug, in our case, we're using clozapine and oxide or CNO, is able to activate um, um, this neuron leading to neuronal activation. And so to activate neurons that are um, positive, double positive for both KLB and um, VGLUT2, we generated a very complex triple knock-in mouse line where we took FLIP-dependent, Cree-dependent dread mice, and we crossed those to a VGLUT2 FLIP and KLB Cree um, mice 
to generate KLB v glut 2 dread mice. So we're able to um, effectively activate um, neurons that are double positive for both KLB and v glut 2 in response to CNO. And so we gave um, these mice, along with their wild type counterparts, the choice between water and sucrose and measured their sucrose intake in response to vehicle and CNO. And what we found was that um, our KLB v glut 2 dread mice responded to CNO by decreasing their sucrose intake. So activation of um, neurons within the brain that are double positive for KLB and VGLUT2 is sufficient to lower sucrose intake. We then wanted to know where 21 may be acting to lower um, sugar intake. And so previous data published from our lab suggested that FGF21 may be signaling, signaling to the PVN to lower sugar intake. And so when I joined the lab, I was really interested in understanding or um, identifying the neuronal population within the PVN that, K that FGF21 may be signaling to. And one of the neurons that really stood out to me were oxytocin neurons. So oxytocin has been shown to um, mediate carbohydrate specific intake in a manner um, very similar to FGF21. And so what we did is we generated mice that lack KLB from oxytocin neurons by um, generating these KLB oxytocin knockout mice. And we gave these mice, along with their wild type counterparts, the choice between water and sucrose and measured their sucrose intake in response to FTF21. And surprisingly, we did see a decrease in sucrose intake in our KLB oxytocin um, knockout mice in response to FGF21. We then decided to remove KLB from the entire PVN using a SIM1 Cree driver line. So SIM1 is a marker of the um, PVN. And again, what we found was that our KLB SIM1 um, knockout mice responded to 21 by decreasing their sucrose intake. What is important to note with these data though, is that similar to our KLB VGLUT2 knockout mice, we did see a increase in basal sucrose intake in both the KLB oxytocin and the KLB SIM1 knockout mice, indicating that while um, FGF20, or while KLB expression in the PVN may not be um, required for FGF21 um, or pharmacological FGF21 to lower sugar intake, KLB expression in the PVN is important for endogenous FGF21 to regulate sugar intake. We then decided to take a step back and sort of um, look through the entire hypothalamus to find um, regions that may be activated in response to FGF21 administration. And so what we did is we used a neuronal activation marker, CFOS, and um, we stained, um, so we took our KLB creatine tomato mice, we um, gave them IP injections of either vehicle or CNO, um, or I'm sorry, vehicle or FGF21. And then um, we sacrificed these mice. And an hour later, we um, took brain sections from these mice and um, stained for CFOS. And what we found was that we got um, robust CFOS activation within the VMH specifically. And what's important to note is that these um, um, neurons that are activated were um, KLB positive, indicating that FGF21 is directly acting in the VMH to activate these neurons. So um, we decided to remove KLB expression from the entire VMH using a um, VMH marker SF1. So we generated KLB SF1 knockout mice and um, again, gave them the choice between water and sucrose and measured their sucrose intake in response to FGF21. And what we found was that while wild type mice um, have a decrease in sucrose intake in response to FGF21, this effect was lost in our KLB, SIM1, KLB SF1 knockout mice, indicating that FGF21 is acting specifically in the VMH to lower sucrose intake. Surprisingly, um, when we repeated these experiments using the non-caloric sweetener saccharin, um, we found that FGF21 was still able to lower saccharin intake in um, our KLB SF1 knockout mice. So while FGF21 may be acting in the VMH to lower sucrose intake, it's acting elsewhere to lower non-caloric sugar intake. We then wanted to know whether direct administration of FGF21 into the VMH was sufficient to lower sugar intake. And so what we did is we dropped in FGF21, either vehicle or FGF21 into the VMH um, through unilateral cannula infusions 
Um, and we also, as a control, um, put in vehicle or FGF21 over the nucleus accumbens. And what we found was that um, direct administration of FGF21 over the VMH or into the VMH was sufficient to lower sucrose intake. And this effect was not seen in our control studies, indicating that FGF21 is both sufficient um, and, um, or FGF21 signaling to the VMH is both sufficient and required for its effects on lowering sugar intake. Now, within the VMH or the ventral medial hypothalamus, we have um, two main subsets of neurons. So we have glucose inhibited and glucose excited neurons. So under like um, hypoglycemia, I'm sorry, under hypoglycemia, um, so low glucose levels, glucose inhibited neurons are activated and they're able to send um, uh, signals to um, peripheral tissues like the liver to induce glucose production. Alternatively, under conditions of hyperglycemia, so high glucose levels, glucose excited neurons are activated and these neurons are able to send signals to peripheral tissues to induce glucose uptake or halt glucose production. And so these um, neurons can work in tandem to regulate glucose homeostasis. So we wanted to know which subset of glucose sensing neurons is FGF21 signaling to? Is it signaling to glucose inhibited or glucose excited neurons or both? And so this work was done in collaboration with an uh, amazing postdoc in our lab, Dr. Kyle Flippo, along with a um, fellow faculty member in our department, Dr. Dennis Adestoy. And what Kyle and Dennis did is they took um, our KLB cream mice and infected them with a PHPB flex TD tomato virus. And um, they did whole cell patch clamp recording, recordings from the hypothalamus of um, TD tomato positive cells. And um, we had three different conditions here. So we had mice that were IP injected with either saline or FGF21 an hour prior to recording. And then we also directly back applied FGF21 um, um, directly onto the um, hypothalamic brain slices to see what effect direct um, FGF21 application, application would be having. And what we found was that um, both bath applied and mice that were um, injected with FGF21 had an uh, a increase in action potential firing in response to FGF21. So they had a decrease in membrane potential. To um, determine whether um, FGF21 is altering neuronal activity or action potential firing um, in the context of um, varying levels of glucose concentration, um, what we did is we took KLB cream mice and infected in a GCAMP virus um, into, specifically into the VMH, and we measured calcium activity to effectively measure neuronal activity. And we did this under two different um, conditions, so hyperglycemic conditions where we're going from low to high glucose, and under hypoglycemic conditions where we're going from high to low glucose concentrations. And this was done in the presence and absence of FGF21. So um, this first um, data set that I'm showing you, you here is um, data from um, the brain slices that were treated with hyperglycemic conditions, so going from low to high glucose levels. Um, and what we found is that we're recording from glucose excited neurons here because we're getting an increase in um, calcium fluorescence, indicating an increase in neuronal activation. Um, and this um, increase in calcium fluorescence was potentiated by the treatment of FGF21. We also recorded from glucose inhibited neurons um, because in response to increasing levels of glucose, we're getting a decrease in calcium fluorescence. And again, this decrease was um, potentiated by FGF21. When we um, um, did the opposite, so going from high to low glucose concentration, so under conditions of hypoglycemia, we found that FGF21 had no effect on either glucose excited or glucose inhibited neurons, which makes sense because we have a model where FGF21 is being activated in response to um, increasing levels of glucose. So um, these data suggest that FGF21 is increasing both glucose, glucose excited and glucose inhibited neuron sensitivity to um, increasing levels of glucose. 
So altogether, we have a model here that upon um, uh, high glucose levels, I, either liver derived or pharmacological FGF21 is able to act on um, glutamatergic neurons specifically within the VMH. And these glutamatergic neurons are either glucose excited and glucose inhibited neurons um, to lower sucrose intake. Um, alternatively, we have also found that FGF21 acts in um, or, on um, or on glutamatergic neurons within the PVN to lower basal sucrose intake. And finally, I wasn't able to show you the data here, but um, we know that FGF21 is also um, acting outside of the VMH to increase energy expenditure and decrease sweet taste preference. And so I'd like to quickly acknowledge the members of the Pot Off Lab. Thank you to Matt, shown here, for being an excellent mentor and um, just being super supportive and being really excited about um, this work. Um, Dr. Kyle Flippo, like I said, did a lot of the electrophysiology as well as the single cell RNA sequencing. And um, like I said, I didn't get to talk about Dr. Kristen Claflin's work, but she did a lot of the um, energy expenditure work. I'd also like to thank our collaborators, specifically um, Dr. Matthew Gillum for providing us with our KLB cream ice, um, along with our funding. And finally, um, we do, Matt is looking for um, excited postdocs to join our lab. So if you know anyone who wants to work on anything related to um, FGF21, please don't hesitate to either contact me or Matt um, to get that set up. And we're not doing questions now, but I'd be happy to take any questions that you guys, you guys may have at the end of the session. Thank you. Nice job, Sharon. Um, and just to remind everybody, um, just pop your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen and Pete and I will collate them all and ask them at the end. Um, on to our next speaker. This is Morten Dahl. Um, Morten is a fellow of the Danish uh, Diabetes Academy and works as a postdoc at the NNF Center for Basic Metabolic Research at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, Morton's main scientific interest is the pathways involved um, in the progression of steatosis, steatohepatitis in the liver, I should be able to say that I study it. Um, his current project investigates the relationship between hepatic NAD metabolism and the development of liver fibrosis. Uh, right now he's living in Copenhagen with his wife his daughter and his two fat cats. Um, thanks for the bit of comedy, Morton, uh, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much. I'll put, uh, share my screen here. All right, can everyone see? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a tough presentation to follow, a lot of uh, cool data there but I'll do my best to make this interesting. Uh, yeah, as the introduction said, my name is Morten. I'm a postdoc at the NF Center for Basic Metabolic Research at the University of Copenhagen. And I'm gonna tell you about the relationship between nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide or NAD metabolism and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD. And before I begin, I'd actually like to uh, start with the acknowledgement because I have a tendency to ramble and I'll probably run out of time, so I would like to get that out of the way. So I work at the University of Copenhagen in this beautiful building called the Mask Tower. Here, I work in the lab of uh, Jonas Trebak, you can see here. And uh, of course, um, yeah, I'm not alone in this project. We have a lot of really good collaborators on here. Uh, I'll highlight our PhD student, Anna Hassing, who has done a lot of good uh, work on the project. And also, I'll show you some, uh, some data from some of our collaborators. We've gotten some really cool proteomics analysis done from the Center for Protein Research by Lili Mu, uh, some beautiful histology from the Institute of Biomedicine, and some respirometry measurement for the Center for Healthy Aging. And also, I'd like to thank the Danish Diabetes Academy for, uh, for funding my postdoc studies here. All right. The main focus of, uh, of our research group is uh, NAD. It's a very, very important molecule for basically all the cells in, uh, in the body. Um, it's um, most well known for its role in ATP production, where it contributes to uh, both OXFOS pathway and the TCA cycle, but it's also used for other important enzymes such as the sirtuins that regulate 
metabolic regulations, processes, and the PARPs that uh, are important part of the DNA damage response, and CD38, which uh, regulates calcium signaling and other secondary messengers. Um, and the reason why we're interested uh, in, uh, in NAFLD specifically uh, is because we currently live in a NAFLD epidemic. Um, if you look at uh, this figure here, you can see the prevalence of NAFLD uh, in, in selected countries and in countries like the US, prevalence have reached uh, 30%, which is an insanely high number. And what you can also see from this specific figure is that prevalence of NAFLD uh, correlates with the prevalence of obesity. And as we all know, the prevalence of obesity is increasing worldwide. Uh, so this means that prevalence of NAFLD will also increase with it. NAFLD is a spectrum of uh, conditions ranging from simple steatosis, which is characterized by uh, fat deposition in the liver, to uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis which, with uh, inflammation, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis with fibrosis, uh, and uh, if left unchecked, this condition can progress to cirrhosis, and greatly increase the risk of developing uh, liver cancer. So it can be fatal for the patient if left unchecked. One thing I'll highlight from this figure here is that several of the early steps of the condition are reversible, uh, especially by lifestyle interventions. So uh, this means that, that, yeah, that they can be reversed. And one of my main scientific curiosities are about what pathways determine whether uh, NAFLD progresses from fatty liver to these conditions here. Can we identify what happens and can we possibly target these to prevent progression or reverse it? And that's where NAD really enters the picture here. Because precursors for NAD um, have been proposed as a possible treatment for NAFLD, especially uh, this molecule here, nicotinamide riboside, has received quite a lot of attention in recent years. It's turned into NAD um, and it's sold actually as a dietary supplement over the counter. Uh, this is from one of the producers, just took from their website. You can see they promise that they will give your cells an essential tool for energy creation and you can get a boost when you need it the most. It's basically often sold as an anti-aging um, supplement. But there are some indications from, uh, uh, many indications actually, that it can be used uh, as an intervention for uh, NAFLD. So what I'm showing you here is um, a figure from a paper from 2016, uh, which um, is from a mouse study. They fed the mice a high fat, high sucrose diet, which is a diet that induced severe steatosis. As you can see here, all the, the white specks are lipids accumulating in the liver. But, uh, and this, this uh, steatosis is associated with the decrease in liver NAD content. But when they give this molecule here as a dietary supplement, they increase NAD levels in the liver and they actually prevent the triglyceride deposition. And even if they give it as, a, as an intervention after the induction of steatosis, then you can also get an improved uh, liver um, uh, metabolic profile. And this seems to have some relevance in patients. Uh, our group was part of a study that investigated the effect of nicotinamide riboside supplementation in obese insulin resistant men. And what they saw there was that hepatic lipid content that was a borderline decrease following um, NR supplementation in these, uh, in these men here. Uh, it seemed to be Maybe that there were some that responded quite well to it and others that were non-responders. So it's, it's a borderline effect, but it shows that, that this might have relevancy for, for therapeutic use. So the main um, focus of my PhD project and our postdoc project is to really understand this relationship between NAD and NAFLD. Um, especially this, this decline that that was observed in previous papers. Because the way I see it, it, it could be a contributing factor where the, the lack of NAD in the liver is actually making the liver more susceptible towards damage. And then that drives the, the accumulation of lipids and development of NAFLD. Or it could be a secondary effect. It's pretty clear from these data that, that it's beneficial for the liver to get NAD supplementation or to get these precursors 
But is it really something that happens, this decline, later after you already have the liver damage? So I've spent a lot of time investigating this specific question. And uh, I just want to talk very briefly about the different pathways responsible for making NAD in the liver. I uh, introduced these three groups of enzymes uh, in the beginning of my talk. But what I didn't say was that activity of these three important families are actually that they consume the NAD. Um, they turn it into nicotinamide. So it's necessary to have pathways to restore it. Uh, it can be done in a two-step process, first through the enzyme NAMD, which turns it into nicotinamide mononucleotide, and then to NAD through NMNAT. The liver can also make NAD from the amino acid tryptophan, from nicotinic acid, uh, and of course, we can make it through nicotinamide riboside, uh, through the NR kinases here. And we, we utilized these pathways to really investigate uh, the role of NAMD in the, uh, uh, of NAD in the liver, because by manipulating these pathways, we can create a situation where the liver has low NAD levels, and then we can investigate what that does to liver metabolism. And in our specific case, we made a hepatocyte-specific knockout of the gene NAMD. For, uh, this is, uh, it's the enzyme that drives the conversion of nicotinamide to NMN. And we do that by using the uh, Crelox P system that was introduced in our first talk. I'll just explain it very briefly if some of you are not familiar with it. What you do is that you modify the NAMD gene in this case uh, with these LOXP sequences, and then you cross this mouse with the FLOX, as we call it, NAMD gene with a mouse that expresses a recombinase specifically in the liver. It's coupled to the albumin gene uh, promoter. And when you cross these mice, you will get mice that express the Cree recombinase in the liver. They, it will recognize these sequences here and it will cut NAMD out of the genome. And I spent most of my PhD to characterizing these liver specific NAMD knockout mice. And what we could see quite from the beginning of the project basically was that these mice had no obvious phenotype. They have about a 50% reduction in liver NAD levels, but they have normal glucose tolerance normal liver morphology, um, they respond to a high fat diet to a similar degree, and they have a normal mitochondrial function. And I will not talk so much about the data from this project. We published it last year, so you can read it if, if, you, uh, if you're interested. Uh, but we could basically see that having low NAD levels was not in itself something that caused liver abnormalities. One piece of data from this paper I will highlight is an experiment I did with uh, a postdoc from our uh, metabolism center called Sam Trammell, because him and I um, made, he's a, he's a very, very skilled um, mass spec wizard. Uh, he can really do some amazing things there. We made an a, a experiment in primary mouse hepatocytes that showed that most of this liver NAD in the knockout mice comes from the amino acid tryptophan. And we did that by incubating these primary hepatocytes with 15 N-labeled glutamine. Tryptophan uh, requires glutamine to be turned into NAD. So by labeling it, we could see how much of this NAD came from tryptophan. And what we saw was that the knockouts, which are the two lines you can see here, have a higher enrichment of the labeled NAD when they're incubated with 15 N-glutamine. Glutamine. So that's basically how they compensate to a large degree uh, by for not having this NAMD pathway. Um, so we could show from this that having low NAD levels is not uh, necessarily causing uh, any abnormal liver phenotypes. But we then wondered maybe the mice were more susceptible to, to, to challenges. And for that, we designed an experiment where we, um, we gave mice a uh, low methionine choline deficient high fat diet or MCD diet for short. And it's, it's a diet that's a really potent inducer of steatosis in rodents. So just three weeks of this diet will give you a liver morphology that looks like this. All of the white specks are lipids. So you can see there's massive steatosis there. Uh, and these data are unpublished. We're working on uh, publishing them at the moment. So um, yeah, it's, it's some brand new stuff for you here. We gave this to our wild-type mice and our uh, Hinko mice, the hepatocyte-specific 
NAMP knockouts, what we could see from the get-go was that these mice did not like this diet. They lost several grams of lean mass and they had an increase in plasma ALT activity, which is a sign that the liver is damaged there. When we looked at uh, the h &E stainings to look at the morphology, we could see that they accumulated less lipid, so low NAMPT uh, levels here did not give you more steatosis, but they had these areas of necrotic tissue with cell infiltration, and when we stained for fibrosis, we could see collagen depositions around the liver lobuli. So this was actually, we could see it here, having low NAD levels here made the mice more susceptible to liver damage. But we also had a very surprising finding, and that was when we looked at the mice from the control groups. They actually had some sort of low-grade liver damage as well, not as drastic as for the MCD diet, but they still had cell infiltration, they had necrotic areas, and they actually even had fibrosis. And we were really surprised by this data because we just spent so much time basically showing that they had no phenotype. So what was going on here? We figured it might have something to do with the control diet. We used the purified control diet that we used in this study. So we tested this diet versus a normal chow diet because we could see, for example, that this precurve nicotinic acid, that there was twice as much in this diet as in the PD, the purified diet. And that really made a major difference here. The chow diet was basically masking the phenotype. No signs of fibrosis, no necrosis where they get chow diet. When we looked at liver NAD levels, we could see that even the wild type mice actually had a quite substantial decrease from this purified control diet. So by restricting the NAD precursor intake, we could actually get a phenotype in our knockouts. So next, we designed an experiment to further test this hypothesis. This was done by our PhD student, Anna Hassing, where we designed a nicotinic acid enriched purified diet. So we gave them levels similar to the um, chow diet. And we could see that this is not the whole explanation. There are still signs of fibrosis in the knockouts that get this enhanced diet. But we could see that inflammation scores decreased and necrosis scores decreased severely. So this is, it, I mean, this is milligrams per kilo. Um, um, this is mi micrograms of difference in intake for the mice that makes such a major difference on the liver phenotype. I think it's really, really fascinating stuff. So one of the cardinal experiments uh, here is of course to identify a, um, a mechanism behind this. And for that, we designed an experiment where we used uh, an intervention study with nicotinamide riboside. We gave mice three weeks with the uh, purified diet to induce the phenotype. Then we did a three week intervention with nicotinamide riboside in the drinking water. And then we wanted to use a proteomics based approach to see what uh, pathways are activated upon the purified diet exposure and what pathways are rescued when we give the intervention. We also did some basic histology. We could see that the intervention caused a borderline decrease in fibrosis scores and a significant reduction in inflammation scores. Um, and a quite marked increase in liver NAD content. So it's really, really a potent way to increase liver NAD levels. Then we worked together with um, Matthias Mann's group at the uh, Center for Protein Research at the university and a really talented PhD student called Lily Liu. She did a proteomics analysis for us on our four groups. And uh, we, the, what I've shown you here is an upset plot that shows how many proteins are significantly altered in, in different groups and in combinations here. But I want to put your attention to the set size because that really shows some, some highlights here that, for example, this here shows that there are more than 600 proteins altered by genotype in the control group. So that's basically the, the knockout effect. And uh, more than almost 400 proteins are affected in the knockout group by the intervention. And by analyzing this, we can get a pretty good idea about what's going on, what's causing this phenotype. So if we look at the knockout effect first, it's mainly masked by that we have a cytoskeletal organization, we have collagen metabolism. This is basically what we can see, activation of stellate cells, it's collagen synthesis. So there's not really much mechanistic showing here. 
if we look at the proteins in the treatment effect and do an gene ontology enrichment, we can see that we have oxidation reduction processes, we have uh, carboxylic acid processes, cellular respiration. This is basically mitochondrial function. So even though we had spent so much time showing that mitochondrial function was not altered, well, when we gave this purified diet and starved the liver of NAD, then we actually got a mitochondrial phenotype. If we looked at more specifically what proteins were affected in the knockout group, this is a heat map, we could see that most of these proteins were reduced in the knockout group and rescued abundance with the NR treatment. And most of these were, a lot of these were involved in oxidative phosphorylation in the TCA cycle. Um, and we then wondered, maybe this has, um, can, can we actually show that this causes mitochondrial dysfunction? And we did that using an oxygraph, which is a machine where you put in a piece of tissue, then you can measure the oxygen consumption. And what we saw was that when we had given mice this purified diet, we had an impaired oxygen consumption rate when we added succinate and induced maximal respiration. So it actually, it has, they have a mitochondrial dysfunction here. They, they are not working as effectively as wild type mitochondria. I think it's really, really fascinating here. So to summarize these, these data, it suggests to us that there is a lower threshold in the liver for NAD levels that determines how well the liver can function. And of course, that's not surprising that you need some, but I still think it's quite surprising that you can have a 50% reduction and still have a normal liver function, normal mitochondrial function. But if you restrict precursor intake in these knockout mice and you cross this threshold, then you're more susceptible to liver damage. You will get fibrosis, you will get cell infiltration, and you'll get mitochondrial dysfunction. And what does this mean for the therapeutic potential of NR? Well, I think, of course, we need to understand the metabolomics of, of human FLD better. But if we can identify steps in this process here where NAD levels are declining or where mitochondrial function is declining, we might be able to give nicotinamide riboside to either prevent progression or to actually help the liver regenerate and recover from this. Um, I think that's all for me. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Feel free to uh, ask me stuff on Twitter if there's something you want me to elaborate on. Thank you very much. Okay, good job, Morton. Um, so I'm going to kick it off the Q&A by um, asking Sharon a couple of questions. I'm just going to check some out on the Q&A box. Um, so to start off, Sharon, um, have you considered, um, just kind of, I think this is going back to the summary picture that you showed at the end, have you considered uh, brown adipose tissue um, and FGF1 coming from brown adipose tissue? Um, and is this also released in targeting to the brain? Um, yeah, so we know that all the effects of FGF21 that we're seeing, especially on sugar intake, is through the liver. Um, so when we use FGF21 liver-specific knockout mice, we lose the effects on FGF21 on lowering sugar intake. So um, while... I mean, while FGF21 coming from brown adipose tissue may be playing a role in some other aspects, we know that the liver is responsible for its effects on lowering sugar intake. Cool. Great. Um, I have one coming in here from Paul Waitman of Pottery University of Exeter. Um, I wonder uh, if FGF21 is acting on astrocytes or other glial cells, and uh, which then modulate hypothalamic neurons. Um, via glial transmission? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, if you um, refer back to our single cell RNA analysis, uh, there was a small percentage of uh, KLB that was actually expressed on neuronal cell types, and a lot of um, KLB is expressed in other um, uh, cell types like astrocytes or glial cells. Um, so the short answer is we, I mean, we haven't tested that directly yet, um, we do, we, I know that um, VGLUT2 is expressed on glial cells, so it's possible, but um, to my knowledge, I think that SF1 um, 
cells are specific to neurons. So when we remove KLB from SF1, we lose its effects um, or FGF21's effects on lowering sugar intake. Um, but yeah, we haven't tested that directly. Cool. Um, and then I've got one from Joe Edward Lewis at the University of Cambridge. Um, was KLB expression limited to the hypothalamus? And then no. was, uh, no, okay, that might <laughs> answer his question. Um, and then this is a couple kind of like asking about, I know you mentioned you didn't really touch on the energy expenditure in terms of FGF21 increasing energy expenditure. And then also um, one person here is asking, is FGF21 treatment suppresses sucrose intake? Was there a large increase in water intake or anything like that? Yeah. So. Sorry, to go back quickly to the last question, we did see KLB outside of the hypothalamus in the hindbrain, NCS, AP, um, as well as regions of the forebrain. So it is expressed kind of throughout the brain. Um, for the water intake, um, I personally have not ever seen FGF21 have, have an effect on um, increasing water intake, even when the mice drink less sugar, um, their water intake kind of like still stays the same. So I haven't seen that in my experiments, but I know that there are a few or there's another lab that um, published and said that FGF21 increases water intake. We haven't been able to recapitulate that data in our lab, though. Pete, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, thanks. Thanks for that, Sharon. So um, there's another question that came through from Laura Rich at the University of Nottingham, um, who was asking about the potential effectiveness of FGF21 in humans, self senses, olfaction, etc., influence for intake of food. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, to my knowledge, there have been no um, companies or pharmaceutical companies that have tested the effects of FGF21 on carbohydrate intake in humans. Um, a lot of the studies that they're doing is focused more on the um, uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and um, insulin sensitizing effects. So I would love to see <laughs> what effect it's having on humans. I'm assuming that it does because um, this whole um, project started based on um, uh, GWAS studies that showed that individuals with SNPs in the FGF21 gene had um, reported to have an increase in um, carbohydrate intake specifically. So I'm assuming that pharmacological administration of FGF21 in humans will have an effect on um, lowering sugar intake, but I haven't seen any of those studies yet. Okay, great. And um, just a question for myself. So you mentioned at the beginning that there's this effect of FGF21 on um, sugar and alcohol intake as well. Do you have any idea where in the brain is regulating these effects on alcohol intake? Are they the same neurons? Yeah, so um, that work is actually being done by um, Kyle Flippo, who helped with this project. It's not the same, I don't believe it's the same neurons. Um, uh, he is looking specifically in the amygdala for um, those effects, and he has data to suggest that it may be in the amygdala. Um, but no, it's, we don't think it's the same. We think the energy expenditure effects, the sugar intake, and then the alcohol intake are all different neurons. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll just move on to some questions for Morton now. Thanks a lot for that, Sharon. Great. Um, Morton, so Joe Edward Lewis from the University of Cambridge was asking the HNKO mice have a 50% re reduction in NAD. Um, what happens if you age these mice, which is associated with reduced NAD? Um, it's, it's in the JBC paper, actually, and it's one of the weirder observations of that paper because we, did, we observed that their NAD levels actually increase with age, which is really, really odd <laughs> because it's been the, the decline with age has been has been uh, reported several times i my guess on what happens is that the liver probably adapts with age um, to be, rely even more on the tryptophan uh, alternative pathways um, but we can actually see that yeah they they seem to maybe even separate a bit so some of them gain quite high nad levels with age and some of them w w which have beginning uh, end stage liver disease like um, these inbred mouse strains are very cancer prone so when some of them start to develop these phenotypes NAD levels really really go down but a lot of them seem to adapt. Okay great and um, there's a question from Ariana Fazato who asked if you verified what was happening to the mitochondria maybe with TEM to see whether there's differences in fusion fission cycle etc. 
it's a really, really interesting idea and something we've considered doing. Um, our mitochondria data are actually quite new, so we're still uh, we're still planning on on how to proceed down that line. Um, but as you might glimpse from from this presentation, we really have a lot of of data um, describing like the the ups and downs of this diet effect because it's it's so in so little extra precursor can do so majorly different things to the liver. So at the moment, I think we're content knowing that there is something with the mitochondria and then we might investigate the specifics of the mitochondrial dynamics down the line. But it's a really good question. Great. Thanks, Martin. And then one more. So there was, there was a few more questions. Um, is NAM produced in patients with NAFLD? Uh, is there any data to suggest supplementation of NAD precursors reverses this? That is also a good question and one that's been discussed in the field. And for a long while, uh, I think there were some, some studies pointing in different, uh, in opposite directions, because most of it was based on, uh, on mRNA data obtained from liver biopsies. And uh, recently, some proteomic data sets have emerged that I've tried to look a bit through, because of course that's of interest to us. And those suggest that there are no change with um, NAFLD uh, in, in humans. But the problem is always to get a good control group because liver biopsies are so hard to obtain. So, so this, I've often found it a bit hard to come, what you compare to um, when you have these uh, studies. So I would, from, from top of my memory, I don't think the recent proteomics data have, have shown a dec decrease, no. Great, thanks, Martin. Uh, Mary, you had a couple of questions. Oh, just unmute. Yeah, telling me that now. There's a couple of final questions here, Martin. So one question was, was the gluconeogenic capacity altered in your model? Uh, it is not, and we've tested that both on, uh, on the chow diet and the, the purified diet um, using power of tolerance tests. That's not altered. Um, we've done some primary hepatocyte experiments where we look at glucose excretion, and that seems to be maintained as well. Um, so, so they are capable of 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 doing gluconeogenesis just fine. Great. Um, and then one final one, and this is also one I kind of had as well, uh, coming in from Jim Pritchett at Manchester Metropolitan College. Um, Two great, he said two great, re really good talks, guys. Um, and then his question was, have you looked at the effect um, on cell at cells uh, in your hepatocyte knockout model? And does NAD have any role in hepatic cell at cell activation? And what would you happen if you targeted your deletion to hepatic cell at cells versus hepatocytes? That's a really, really interesting question and one that I would like to pursue further. Um, there was, I can't remember the specifics, but there was a study coming out, I think it was last year, which showed that, uh, that if you gave nicotinamide riboside to stellate cells, you attenuated their activation uh, profile. So I think they made less TTF beta and synthesized less collagen. So it does look like that NAD levels can do something for them. Whatever it does something here, I mean, obviously we have done, um, smooth muscle activant stainings that shows that you have really, really high uh, activity of uh, the stellate cells into myofibroblasts. They should have normal NAD levels uh, because we, our deletion is, uh, is done through the albumin promoter. So that should ensure that it's only the hepatocytes that lacks NAMT in this specific case. Whether that does something to the I don't know, local NAD precursor environment within the liver. I don't know about that. The, but any activation of uh, stellate cells we see here should be a secondary effect of, the, of what happens in the hepatocytes. But um, it's also, a, I think, a very interesting avenue to pursue also like if how much of this damage is driven by uh, HSC activation. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Martin. Uh, it was a great, great answer. Thank you both for two fantastic talks. Thank you to Mary for co-chairing. And I hope you'll all join us next week for our sixth session, which is the neuroendocrine regulation of energy balance. Thank you very much.